How's it going, everybody? My name is Josh, amateur radio call sign KI6NAZ. We are continuing our technician study course. Hopefully, you have been encouraged to get your technician license and join us on amateur radio, often called ham radio. This is sub element three, which covers radio wave propagation one of my favorite sub elements. There is a playlist in the description as well as a video on the top of that playlist that explains how to use this study approach along with hamstudy.org, which is a free website that can track your practice tests and tell you which sub, sub elements you need to brush up on, which is where these videos come in. Go to the sub element that you're having issue with, watch it, or just listen in the background. There's not a whole lot that I'm gonna be doing video wise other than a couple of key pop-ups at key points and hopefully talk you through the right answers which you should be focusing on to practice and pass your test. Sub element three is broken up into three sections. We're gonna start with alpha. This is based on radio wave characteristics, how radio signals travel, multipath, wavelength and absorption, and antenna orientation. So we're gonna start out with alpha zero one. Why do VHF, which is an acronym, very high frequency signals strengths sometimes vary greatly when the antenna is moved only a few feet? The answer is C, multi-path propagation cancels or reinforces your signal. So if you're having trouble hitting a repeater or talking to a friend on simplex, try moving around a little bit. There will be a myriad of reasons why in some cases only stepping a couple feet in one direction makes your signal stronger or less powerful, but that's something to keep in mind if you're not able to make a contact or establish a repeater connection when you normally have no issue doing so. Alpha zero two, what is the effect of vegetation on UHF and microwave signals? B, absorption. The signals will actually be absorbed by trees and whatnot. So if you're in a heavily wooded environment, you may want to use two meter, which is a VHF band. Uh, you can also try UHF, but you may be faced with absorption. Sometimes you'll find as well when you are in the spring months when there's lots of leaves and whatnot on the trees that you actually experience more absorption than in the winter when all the trees have no leaves, depending on where you're at, of course, geographically. Alpha zero three, what antenna polarization is normally used for long distance CW and SSB, which is an abbreviation for single sideband. CW is also an abbreviation for continuous wave. We use that almost uh, identical to Morse code when you hear that used. On the VHF and UHF, again, another acronym, very high frequency and ultra high frequency bands. And the answer is C, horizontal polarization. Now, this question is probably gonna come up again. FM, frequency modulation, if we're using that mode, then you generally use vertical polarization. Some have asked why, and the answer is because that's how they decided to do it in the past, and it's just kinda stuck around that way. And yes, that's really the answer. There's no benefit um, horizontal or vertical unless you're talking about specific antenna designs. It's more or less using what everybody around you is also using to make your signal as likely to be heard or to hear others as possible. Alpha zero four, what happens when antennas at opposite ends of a VHF or UHF line of sight radio link are not using the same polarization? So. Bob down the street, you wanna to talk to him, he's on a vertical and you're on a horizontal. Uh-oh, what happens? Well, B, received signal strength is reduced, uh, considerably reduced in some cases. So wherever possible for line of sight radio, use the same polarized antennas, whichever way you wanna go. Generally, if it's a vertical antenna, it's a vertical polarization. Easy to keep in mind. If it's a horizontal dipole, meaning two legs like this, or a yagi, something where you see multiple elements, that's horizontal. Alpha zero five, when using a directional antenna, how might your station be able to communicate with a distant repeater if buildings or obstructions are blocking the direct line of sight path? B, try to find a path that reflects signals to the repeater. Yeah, there's multiple instances where people have used the side of a mountain to reflect their signals into a repeater using a directional antenna. 
Directional implies, much like a flashlight, where most of your light is going in one direction. One such antenna design is called a Yagi Uda. I mentioned it earlier, where you have like stacked horizontal lines that kind of all gradually get smaller as you get towards the front of the antenna. That is a directional antenna. Alpha 06, what is the meaning of the term picket fencing? And that's B, a rapid flutter on mobile signals due to multi-path propagation. This can sometimes be experienced when driving a car and you're talking into a repeater. Alpha 07, what weather condition might decrease range at microwave frequencies? Very high, higher, well, on the high end of UHF into the gigahertz uh, range. That's C, precipitation. Rain will cause degradation of microwave signals. Alpha 08, what is a likely cause of irregular fading of signals propagated by the ionosphere? D, random combining of signals arriving via different paths. So as the signals go through the ionosphere and bounce around and come down, the different paths and different takeoff angles of those signals can affect how they'll be heard at the receiving station. Alpha 09, which of the following results from the fact that signals propagated by the ionosphere are elliptically polarized? That is B, either vertically or horizontally polarized antennas may be used for transmission or reception. This is kind of a fun way of them saying, if you're on HF and the two stations are far enough away that you're not using line of sight communication, then it's highly likely that the signal is going to come down as elliptically polarized. And if it's elliptically polarized, it's going to be heard just about as strongly if you're a vertically polarized antenna or horizontally polarized antenna. Not always, but you still can do similar work with either one. It is sometimes recommended that you have two types of antennas, a vertical and a horizontal, and you can switch between them to hear the signal in the best signal strength. That sometimes helps. Uh, it depends, though, and is not as important than just getting an antenna up and getting on the air. Alpha 10, what effect does multi-path propagation have on data transmissions? D, the error rates are likely to increase as the paths change when the receiving station hears some of the information, particularly for data. There will be points where the two sides have an error or a conflict or a collision in some cases. Alpha 11, which region of the atmosphere can refract or bend HF and VHF, very high frequency, radio waves? The answer is C, the ionosphere. A particular layer or space within our atmosphere where that is possible. Alpha 12, what is the effect of fog and rain on signals in the 10 meters and 6 meter bands? And the answer is B, there is little effect. There you go. That's section A of sub-element 3. Moving on to section B, this is electromagnetic wave proper properties, wavelength versus frequency, nature and velocity of electromagnetic waves, among some other stuff like talking about UHF, VHF, and HF radio frequencies. Bravo 01, what is the relationship between the electric and magnetic fields of a electromagnetic wave? And it's D, they are at right angles. And so if you, there's a cool animated GIF that I'll try and add to this or show a picture at least. They're literally just opposites of each other, the electromagnetic and that's it, the electrical and the magnetic. So uh, as one oscillates up, the other side is oscillating down and they are always in direct opposition to each other, which is kind of cool. Bravo 2, what property of a radio wave defines its polarization? And the answer is A, the orientation of the electric field. Bravo 03, what are the two components of a radio wave? The electric and the magnetic fields. A bit of a repeating there. You will generally get like one question, one or two, sometimes three questions, depending on the size of the sub-element. And so they really want to hit the nail home on this particular side. B04, what is the velocity of a radio wave traveling through free space? Speed of light. 
easy to remember there, I think. Bravo05, what is the relationship between wavelength and frequency? Wavelength gets shorter as frequency increases. So you get more of it as you get higher up or the space within. Wavelength gets shorter as the frequency goes up. So this is a byproduct of the very name of the bands. If you take, let's say, the two meter band and you think 146.520 megahertz is the two meter calling frequency, that is a physical representation of the size of that wavelength, about two meters. Slide all the way down to 14.250 megahertz, and that is roughly 20 meters as a physical representation of bandwidth or wavelength. Bravo 06, what is the formula for converting frequency to approximate wavelength in meters? And the answer is D, wavelength in meters equals 300 divided by frequency in megahertz. So you can do the conversion yourself, take the frequency in megahertz, divide it by 300, and that's the approximate wavelength. Bravo 07, in addition to frequency, which of the following is used to identify amateur radio bands? And it's A, the approximate wavelength in meters, which we've talked about. And that comes up often when we mention a band we're operating on. We'll often say 40 meters or 20 meters or 2 meters. Bravo 08, what frequency range is referred to as VHF? Again, acronym for very high frequency. And the answer is B, 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. Bravo 09, what frequency range is referred to as UHF, ultra high frequency? And that is 300 to 3000 megahertz. Bravo 10, what frequency range is referred to as HF, high frequency? That's three megahertz to 30 megahertz. So high frequency is way down on the lower side of the electromagnetic spectrum for radio, and that's where generally beyond, beyond line of sight radio propagation is available to an amateur radio operator. Bravo 11, what is the approximate velocity of a radio wave in free space? We've kind of already answered this one, right? So B, it's 300,000 meters per second, which is another way of expressing the speed of light. All right, section Charlie within sub-element three. We are gonna talk about propagation modes, sporadic E, meteor scatter, auroral propagation, tropospheric ducting, F region skip, and line of sight radio horizon. Charlie 01, why are simplex UHF signals rarely heard beyond the radio horizon? And the answer is C, UHF signals are usually not propagated by the ionosphere. So two meters will sometimes get into sporadic E and tropospheric ducting, where UHF generally does not. So you will never really achieve more than line of sight communication with UHF. Charlie 02, what is a characteristic of HF communication compared with communication on VHF and higher frequencies? C, long distance ionics, ionospheric propagation is far more common on HF. In fact, it's predominantly what we use. Charlie 03, what is a characteristic of VHF signals received via auroral backscatter? And that is B, they are distorted and signal strengths vary considerably. You can go on Google and you can look up a rural ham radio transmission or backscatter and you should listen to it. It's pretty interesting. It's almost a, a ghostly voice in the radio sometimes. It's, it's pretty cool. Charlie 04, which of the following types of propagation is most commonly associated with a, occasional strong signals on the 10-6 and two meter bands from beyond the radio horizon. And that is B, sporadic E. 
Charlie zero 05, which of the following effects may allow radio signals to travel beyond obstructions between the transmitting and receiving stations? And it is A, knife edge diffraction. This is often seen on mountaintops where you have kind of a steep grade or steepish grade to a top and it literally knife edges over the top. Charlie zero 06, what type of propagation is responsible for allowing over the horizon VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis. And that is A, tropospheric ducting. There are some regions that this is more prevalent in, but it uh, does happen from time to time and is pretty fun when it happens. You start hearing stations from all over the place. Charlie07, what band is best suited for communicating during meteor scatter? And that is B, six meters. And yes, we're talking about bouncing signals off of meteorites. Awesome. Charlie08, what causes a tropospheric ducting? And that is D, temperature inversions in the atmosphere. So kind of like a hot pocket of air <laughs> uh, that, ver that is in variation to that of the surrounding air will sometimes create a situation where we can actually kind of get beyond line of sight communication with VHF radio and also 10 meters, which is considered HF. Charlie09, what is generally the best time of long distance 10 meter band propagation via the F region. And F region in this case is referring to the layers of the atmosphere. They are broken up by different regions, which start with A and they work their way through the rest. A, from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high sunspot activity. Reminder, this is the best time to get your license for 10 meters for technicians will be popping up through 2025 as we enter into the high solar cycle, which means there will be a high sunspot activity that is very good for propagating 10 meter transmissions. Charlie 10, which of the following bands may provide long distance communication via the ionosphere's F region during the peak sunspot cycle? And that is six and 10 meters. So again, they're driving home the concept that 10 meters really likes a lot of solar activity. And when there is a lot of solar activity, 10 meters and six, more so 10 are just gonna be awesome. So get your license. Charlie 11, the last question for sub element three, why is the radio horizon for VHF and UHF signals more distant than the visual horizon? The answer is C, the atmosphere refracts radio waves slightly. So that's why that is. So that was sub element three. I think that some people have issues with this one. There is um, a lot of research one could do on a lot of these terms, and you could have a lot of fun doing that. If you're so inclined, there's a ton of videos that exist on YouTube and uh, a myriad other places on the web that you can find more information on these terms. Far and above, this one, once you kind of get some of the concepts down, this is a pretty straightforward sub element. So I think you'll do fine with this one. If you're enjoying this, give me a thumbs up. If you have not already subscribed, I'm going to link in the cards to the next video in this series, as well as there's a playlist in the description for you to follow along and continue your journey into getting your amateur radio license. I'm Josh KI6NAZ. Thanks so much for watching. 73.